Um, and without further ado, I will hand over the microphone to Andrew Kowalczyn, who many of you know. Andrew now is a businessman. Well, he, was, he has always been a businessman, uh, but he has been in the US Chamber of Commerce in charge of the IP, among many other things, the IP department, but now he is uh, independent, has his own firm as of January 1st, I think, 2017. So another young entrepreneur, uh, intellectual entrepreneur, and also uh, in based in being based in Washington, um, I think he will also very soon make a lot of money, which we all hope. <laughs> um, so Andrew will more or less run the show here on this panel. The second person in charge uh, of this panel is Jared Parks, who is actually more or less new to the European movement. Andrew, uh, Jared is the successor of Andrew at the Chamber of Commerce. He's in charge now of the IP department and um, uh, is one of our allies, I would say, helping uh, industry and link industry with uh, intellectual entrepreneurs when it comes to the issue of um, intellectual property and especially the defense thereof. And last but not least, um, we have uh, Professor Ivan Jovetic from the university here, who is also an entrepreneur and um, uh, fighting for I would say, entrepreneurial freedom and supporting that. Uh, the dividing line uh, that we have, uh, that we face uh, in uh, the think tank movement, in the libertarian world, whether intellectual property rights should be protected or not, uh, is a tough battle. And we have a couple of friends who really um, freak out when we say we want the same protection of intellectual property as we see for physical property. And others say, of course, it's a precondition for us if we do not follow those rules. So it will be extremely interesting to get to hear what the three gentlemen will present. And then I would simply open the debate uh, to all of us. And uh, the goal is also how given what we have discussed in the morning, are there certain cornerstones that we in Europe as free marketeers, as freedom fighters can you know, um, join in and have a common understanding and that we can use this one tool, this one uh, topic as uh, a precondition or as, as something that we can fight together and that people in Spain can use the same uh, materials as our friends in Ukraine or those in Sweden and those in Italy. So this is one of the um, big challenges and tasks that we should find a solution. So have fun with that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Barbara, and thank you to the university for hosting us here. It's a real honor um, to come over here and talk about intellectual property. Um, I, I've been working in the IP community for, for seven years now, and um, I think when you first approach folks and you say intellectual property, a lot of times their eyes roll over. They say, you know, I'm not an intellectual, I'm not an attorney, I don't really understand intellectual property. What does it mean? Well, actually, it, it, it touches everyone, and it's particularly important for, for entrepreneurs. Really, the private sector companies and industry alike are always looking for, for competitive advantages, ways to succeed by developing and incorporating their creative and useful innovations. So IP really touches everything. Um, as I mentioned, with copyrights, patents, trademarks, trade secrets, it's involved in so much in, in business. Um, and it works in, the property rights work in, in really five main ways, that IP benefits an economy, a healthy economy, it helps promote innovation, it helps entrepreneurs monetize their innovations and grow, it helps small and medium-sized enterprises, and it really benefits uh, consumers in the society. Um, a story that I like to tell is, is when I was um, visiting my parents, they said, Andrew, um, I, I get it, you're an advocate, you, you work for IP, but IP really doesn't matter to me. And I said, Dad, I think that it does. And um, I, I tell this story all the time to folks to make it personal. Um, I said, Dad, let's talk about your drugs. Where do you get your drugs from? And he said, well, Andrew, with Obamacare, I get my drugs from Canada now. And I said, okay, I don't think that's actually true, but 
He, and I said, what website? Where do you go? He said, well, I buy them online. That's where I buy all my drugs from. I said, Dad, where do you go online? He said, I go to drugworldcanada.com. And I'm there with my mother, and I type in the computer, drugworldcanada.com, and I pull it up. And he said, look, here it is. It's legitimate. Well, we Google searched the address, and it was actually a parking lot in Canada, not even a physical building. And he said, look, there's an FDA seal in the website. And they had filled it in with the American flag, so added to it. I said, well, great, the FDA seal doesn't have an American flag through it. I said, well, let's look to see where this website is registered. And it was registered out of Columbia. And he said, well, maybe they do that for tax reasons, Andrew. Sure. <laughs> I said, where do you get your drugs from? And he said, well, I get them from India and China. I said, OK. Uh, he said, that's where they're made. I, I said, what do you do about a prescription? He said, oh, you, you can check a box. There's a box that I check to make sure that I have a prescription. I said, how are you paying for these? He said, Andrew, I pay for my drugs with, with a credit card. That's how I purchase drugs online. Um, a lot of these websites that sell counterfeit goods like steal people's identity, and he's been a victim of identity theft. So it, we're starting to see all these trick, things trickle out, and I said, these drugs, these counterfeit drugs, have been rumored to have high levels of metal. And my mother hits him, literally hits him, and said, Larry, maybe this is why you're testing for high levels of metals. I had that drug tested, that drug was Viagra, but I had that drug tested. <laughs> uh, I uh, <laughs> he not know. Uh, which, you know, it's an uncomfortable conversation with my parents. That drug was a, <laughs> that drug was a, a counterfeit, and I had it tested by Pfizer, and it actually turned out to be a good counterfeit. But these are, this is just one example, and he not only was taking the drug, that, and, and heartburn medication and everything else, he was distributing it to my younger brother, to my uncle, and they thought they had legitimate drugs. And there were active ingredients in that drug, but there were some real problems with it. So that's just one example how I think, not only from the business perspective, but when we think about the topic of protection IP, outdated or more important than ever, I think it's really important to have these types of IP protections in place because it not only affects entrepreneurs, businesses, small, medium, and large, it really impacts families, friends. So um, that's something I'd just like to start off with because I think it's really important. Um, you know, w with IP and trade, everything that's going on right now, I think that, you know, the TPP, maybe it's at a deep freeze at best, but I think the emphasis in these trade agreements, one of the most contentious chapters of trade agreements are always intellectual property. To see how countries want to be able to trade on it, want to be able to invest, um, and American companies and international companies, how their intellectual property is going to be treated in that country state is really important. I mean, whether we're seeing bilateral, multilateral, if we even see these anymore, whether they exist, I think that trade negotiators should continue to push all countries to enforce, I, I, to enforce IP laws, uh, laws, especially online. And that personal story is just an example of how it really affects all of us. You may remember two years ago, and Barbara was really helpful with this, uh, an international IP guidelines letter. It was signed by 85 different groups representing 51 countries. And, and as I sat yesterday and listened to some of the speeches about how think tanks can begin to become more effective by not just putting out good policy, but actually weaponizing that policy to push their goals. I think this was a good example. So 85 different groups came together um, to establish a baseline of IP guidelines, really to have your policy discussions up from there. So what were some of the core principles that these 85 different groups uh, outlined in the letter. It was essentially that the rule of law, property, and a trans, uh, transparent political environment are the foundation of fair and prosperous societies. IP rights are affirmed in international treaties as a human right. IP rights promote free speech and expression. IP rights are integral to consumer protection and global security. Strong IP rights and contractual freedom promote a free and competitive markets. IP rights are vital to an economic competitiveness. IP rights must be protected through effective IP provisions and trade agreements, as we just mentioned, and IP rights must be respected and protected online. I think that this is um, really a clear-cut example of how groups were able to unite through the Free Market Roadshow, through the European Resource Bank, have a dialogue, a discussion of what the fundamentals of some good policies are, and, and express that through a letter. That letter was sent to WIPO, um, the World Intellectual Property Organization, the director general there, Francis Gurry, responded in a personal note saying, thank you guys very much for protecting these IP rights and setting a guideline. So that was just a case study that I think of when we talk about being able to effectively implement good policy. Um, you know, there are continue to be threats of uh, international and domestic regarding counterfeit and pirated goods. I mean, these really are, are an issue when you look at 
businesses and communities of tax, uh, the tax revenues that are lost um, from some of these counterfeit goods and pirated goods. These aren't legitimate businesses. They aren't paying the right taxes. They're really just avoiding any type of oversight, um, whether that relates to health and safety or, or taxes. Uh, I have a fact here. The negative impacts of counterfeiting and piracy are projected to drain 4.2 trillion, with a T, from the global economy and put 5.4 million legitimate jobs at risk by 2020, uh, 2022. So, you know, as we have these types of discussions on what we can do, um, April 26 is World IP Day. We're working with groups in the U.S. and really around the globe to help highlight the importance of intellectual property as it represents uh, businesses and associations. There's an ad that we're going to run um, in a U.S. paper, but also internationally um, online and, and promoting it through a variety of different platforms, where we have 48 associations have joined on board saying IP is important and it matters to us. I mean, it's everything from the beverage association uh, to the Candy Association, to the International Franchise Association. All of these businesses and associations are based on strong IP laws, whether it's their trademark, brand, patents, or copyright, and moving recording industry are part of that movement. So I would just really ask that um, you, know, you look for ways for your organizations and groups to be able to highlight this, make IP a priority, and, and really raise the visibility of that. So that's just kind of a brief uh, overview of, of things that I'm working on, things that I've been appreciated uh, that, that you guys have done. I'm going to hand the microphone over to my uh, former colleague, and uh, <laughs> we work with a lot on, on IP together, Jared Parks, uh, to give a perspective from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Thank you, Andrew. Um, you know, you could just say Lipitor and change that story just a little bit. Um, Barbara, thank you very much. Um, and thank you to our hosts at this uh, great university. Um, it's great to be here. Um, as Barbara mentioned, I'm Jared with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. It's my first time um, joining you, so uh, thank you for having me. Looking forward to getting to know all of you better over the next uh, couple of days. Um, I suspect uh, several of you are familiar with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. For those of you who are not, um, it's the world's largest business association. It is um, not at all um, a part of the U.S. government, um, so the name can sometimes be a little bit confusing. Um, we have about um, three million uh, business members um, across every industry sector of every shape and size, <clears throat> and these are businesses uh, both based uh, domestically in the United States and around the world. There are several different groups, um, policy divisions within the chamber. We have a division that just handles energy. We have a, a capital markets division um, and se several others. Many of these uh, individual divisions also have international components within them. <clears throat> I'm in the chamber's um, Global Intellectual Property Center, which, as you'd guess, um, is the branch of the chamber that handles all issues relating to intellectual property. So when we talk about intellectual property, we're talking about patents, copyrights, trademarks, trade secrets. And how that translates into business um, is really with um, the innovative and creative industries. So that's everything from tech, uh, biopharma, film, uh, fashion, uh, consumer goods and brands, and then um, some tobacco on, on trademark and plain packaging issues, which I suspect um, some of you have worked on. Well, I know David's back there. No, you have. Um, <clears throat> so my role within the Global IP Center I now head up um, advocacy and external affairs, although I was An Andrew's deputy for um, five long years. Um, so <laughs> I, uh, <clears throat> feels like 10. Um, so my role within, uh, within the Global IP Center is I'm sort of the conduit and, and liaison to our coalition partners, which includes everybody from um, state and local chambers of commerce across the United States. Every state and city um, has its own chamber of commerce. And these are independent entities, um, but uh, very close partners uh, with the U.S. Chamber. Um, I also handle all of our work um, formerly domestically and now um, internationally um, with think tanks and um, third-party advocacy organizations. So that's kind of what the chamber is and who I am. Um, when we think about um, IP as free market oriented um, individuals, um, you know, we all believe um, in, in personal freedom, in proper <clears throat> property rights. Um, you know, we really, um, speaking for the chamber, believe um, that intellectual property rights are a fundamental part of overall property rights and that um, people have the rights to the fruits of their labor, whether it be manual labor 
or intellectual labor. Um, and actually, um, in the United States, our intellectual property rights are protected in our Constitution, in Article I, Section 8. But um, really, the concept of intellectual property is borrowed from Europe. Um, we took our, um, our um, constitutional protections for intellectual property um, from um, British common law prior to that. So it's really a European concept that, that we have borrowed. Um, one of the things, um, before I kick it to our, our third panelist, that I just wanted to flag, um, I, I unfortunately didn't have enough for everybody, but if maybe you could pass them around. Um, one of the signature um, work products that the Global IP Center produces each year is the Global Intellectual Property Index, or the International IP Index, excuse me. Um, and what this is really intended to do is to benchmark um, the global IP environment. We started it in 2012, um, analyzing um, 12 economies, and in the years since, now it's grown to 45, which now covers 90% um, of global GDP. Um, some interesting things, um, I, I don't know how many of you have been able to see it, but there's a chart that kind of shows where everybody falls. Um, there's been a, a clear pack of worldwide leaders on IP um, that have emerged. Um, the U.S. is narrowly number one, but um, we're just barely there, and we're not here just to brag about the U.S. We actually came in fifth in enforcement and, and tenth in patents. Um, but very close to the U.S. are the U.K., the EU economies, um, and Japan. And then it sort of tapers off from there. But, so there's a clear sort of um, a leader pack um, emerging. And what this really is, is we go to our members and ask them, you know, what is important to you as you make global investment decisions? What kind of IP factors are you looking at? And so there are, I think, 35 um, individual um, indicators that we measure, but they fall broadly into the buckets of patents, copyrights, trademarks, trade secrets, enforcement of IP laws, and then participation in global um, IP treaties and norms. And if anyone's curious, I have the whole index here if you really want to get into some light reading. Um, and so what it's really intended to do is, A, give the business community uh, a standardized tool um, to use when they're evaluating their investment decisions, but also to give to global policymakers and let them know what the business community is looking for um, as they evaluate investments and things like that. So, um, and it's not meant to be, you know, a name and shame document. For those at the bottom, we look at that as an opportunity um, and a roadmap to, um, to you know, sort of tweak their um, domestic IP environment in a way that's going to benefit them um, domestically in their country. So we hope it's a useful tool both to the business community and um, to policymakers around the world. Um, so happy to, to discuss that further and um, look forward to hearing from all of you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, to Barbara and to Milica uh, for inviting me to be part of this event and I would like also to congratulate on organizing this event uh, this year in Montenegro and also in general. Uh, what I liked about uh, this, this panel was the title and the question mark at the end because it really shows, like Barbara said in introduction part, that uh, there is a huge debate uh, in, let's say, the same circle or the same circle of the same original idea, uh, whether we should protect intellectual property rights or not. And that the title remembered me on the story about uh, one-handed economist. Because usually, as you all know, uh, economists say in one hand is this and on the other hand is that. Uh, but I'm afraid that, uh, regarding the title, I'm afraid that the answer is both. That IP protection is outdated and probably should be, should be considered as even more important than ever. Uh, even though this is not my favorite topic, I have to admit, uh, I'm, I'm more than pleased to be in a company of experts uh, of this panel so I can give uh, a non-expert view to, to the topic which I do like. Uh, my personal point is that I follow the Ayn Rand's um, vision regarding this, but actually I think that all three of us do agree that intellectual property rights protection should be, let's say, the part of overall property rights protection. But usually, 
people have, and I'm one of them, uh, have issues with origins of intellectual property protection because it had been uh, more or less uh, related to undeserved monopolies given by the state. And maybe we should think also, if we agree that we should, maybe the audience won't agree, but if we agree that we should protect intellectual property as we are advocating to pro protect all physical, tangible property, maybe we should think who, how, in each of our states should pro protect it. Maybe the state itself is not the first instance to, to do that. Maybe it can be the last one. I still remember one of the quotes that Professor Vukotic told us when we were the students at third or fourth year. He said that profit is in the heads of individuals. And I really believe it's, it's true. I mean, actually, some of my personal experience showed me that he was completely right, even though that I probably didn't understood what he was saying 15 years ago. If that is true, then we must protect intellectual property. If Lysander Spooner was also right that ideas are objects of economic transactions, then again, we must protect intellectual property rights. But sometimes it is, this is one of my doubts, sometimes it is really questionable uh, who owns the idea. I'll tell you one small example. Barbara mentioned my entrepreneurial experience and approximately six to seven years ago when we were facing some challenges in the company, we introduced some client perk, I will say it like that, and we thought it was amazing that we invented the wheel. And then two or three years ago I went to Slovenia and visited the company in the same industry. Ouch. They have the same perk as we did. So who owns the idea? Then we introduced, actually we cut it off something that is really traditional segment of that industry. And again, we were proud because we were, we were solving the challenges we had. We, we didn't do anything um, in advance, nothing planned. And then I went to New York and I found the very same company doing the very same thing. Then, uh, what am I, sometimes when I'm thinking about this, uh, of course, I'm not, I'm not uh, questioning uh, the general acceptance or ignorance of the protection, but sometimes if, maybe we should be cautious. Uh, I'm sorry I couldn't make it to the panel that was before this one regarding sharing economy, which was quite interesting to me, but regarding sharing economy and protection of property rights, maybe today if Couchsurfing protected business model or secret, if it, even though it is questionable what is the secret in couchsurfing. And yesterday there was uh, on Dragon's Den competition, there was uh, a mentioning of couch, couch surfing within the Liberty Radar application. If they did that, uh, could it be possible that today we are not seeing homestay, which went to the past as well? We are not seeing Airbnb, which is quite prominent, and we are not seeing pivoting of Booking.com, because today there is not much difference between Airbnb and Booking.com, today. Again, there is another example that I want to share with you. Uh, UDG is, as you all know, an entrepreneurial project, and yet it hasn't protected trademark, it hasn't protected business model. Even though we said to general public what are some of the elements of technology of UDG, meaning the best lectures, meaning the best and comparable textbooks, meaning international connections, such as this one as well, meaning um, working in a very small groups, meaning uh, enrolling a limited number of students each year at each faculty, no one replicated and we are not protected. And maybe that should, should remain like that, of course. One of the solutions that might happen or might be interesting, maybe we should not, uh, I'm not arguing that we 
as I said, uh, shouldn't uh, protect the rights, but maybe we should, at least in some of our conversation, maybe we should make a distinction between acknowledgement of someone's right and the royalties that may occur from, from it. Uh, when we observe, there, there is another example in Montenegro regarding copyright. There was an association of uh, musician producers, something like that, called PAM P -A -M of Montenegro. And what they did, they signed a contract uh, with Montenegrin Tourism Union and they charged every hospitality establishment for music production, reproduction. Couple of issues that I had uh, in that case. First of all, I know establishments that produced musics from the CDs, which they bought, or someone else bought. So I see and I think that royalties have been paid once. Why to pay them twice? Then n n th there was no individual contract between, let's say, hospitality companies and that association. There was only one sectoral, even though that CTU didn't represent the overall sector. Then, uh, when one of the questions uh, has been risen and, and, and referred to what happens if the establishment is reproducing the foreign music? They said, oh, there is a solution. We have an agreement between uh, us and other national associations. We have never seen that agreement. What happened at the end? Constitutional court uh, made a decision against the association, not because of paying the royalties. No, that was not the question. And we didn't object to pay the, the royalties. But it was because they signed the contract with a sectoral association that didn't represent the whole sector. My point, uh, especially at the last, argument, uh, last example, is that maybe we also need to have competition of those agencies protecting property rights, intellectual property rights at the national level. We had only one NGO, sorry, it was an NGO, I know you don't like it. Uh, it was an NGO and made a lot of mess. Maybe the situation would be completely different if we also had a competition in that, in that sector. So to combine it, uh, the only problem sometimes some of the people I spoke with and, who's, and the other people whose uh, articles I have been reading, uh, I think have uh, with intellectual property protection is the origins, the monopolies, and lack of competition. I'm not uh, trying to propose any model how to solve that. I'm just opening a few questions to, to talk about them and perhaps uh, create them create some solutions, or at least propose them once. And the second open question I also find very interesting is uh, whether it's going to be difficult to collect royalties in the time of not only Bitcoin as a cryptocurrency, but several other crypto cryptocurrencies, and especially in the context of rise of Darknet. Thank you. Thank you very much for those, those comments. Um, I, I'd like to touch on a few of them. Um, I really liked the, the idea that you threw out of who owns the idea. And a lot of people think just because they have an idea that it's theirs. Well, no, there's a certain structure in place in the US and internationally on um, which copyrights, trademarks, and uh, patents are registered with certain offices or divisions of the government. So, you know, a lot of times you're running, well, Jared and I speak to the groups of kids as well, and they'll say, oh, I had an idea, I had the idea first. Well, was that registered? There are certain standards and frameworks in place that vary country by country of which to establish and register these. And really, that's where the rule of law comes into play. I think that, um, you know, a lot of countries don't do the best job of enforcing what current laws are on the books. And when we think about the title, um, is IP um, outdated more than ever? Um, outdated or more important than ever? I like to think about ways that business can take on some of the roles and responsibilities of intellectual property, and that's, I think, particularly important with enforcement. Uh, the example that I think of with the, the U.S. Customs and Border Protection, 
um, are mandated to inspect a certain number of packages that come in through our borders. Well, what I, come, what I learned um, after spending some time with, um, with the relevant offices there is that one package meant one package. It could be um, a whole shipping container or it could be a simple envelope. And that was the same to them. And to me, that was crazy. So they may open one envelope and say that we open one package today or they could look at a shipping container. So they're working with businesses to be able to try to find out how to update, how to modernize those types of inspection practices. So I think that the business community um, can do you know, their role to help with the enforcement efforts. And, and another point that I like to raise, and Jared touched on it briefly with the International IP Index. In the US, we think of IP as a right. It's, it's uh, sounded and secured in our constitution. Internationally, IP is really more of a tool. And that's a, a language and I think a difference and a distinction that's important to reference. Uh, when we, it's really a trade-off. If you have a drug, you register it, you get a patent for a set number of times, and then when that patent's expired, it can go generic. The alternative, and I've had this conversation before with, with libertarians, is never to register it and have it as a trade secret. Then it's kind of a different business model of protecting that trade secret. You never give it to society for the better use. You try to keep it a secret as long as possible. We've seen this, I mean, soda companies have trade secrets that we've all heard about, Coca-Cola, Pepsi. But, so IP really is a tool, it's a trade-off. Um, it's protected for a certain amount of years, whether that's copyright or patents, and then it's given away to the public for the betterment of society. So those are some thoughts um, in, in regards to your comments. Um, I always like real life stories because I, I think you know, that puts it into perspective for us. Something that I may ask Jared to talk about, um, I know he's worked with a lot of individual voices and how to make IP real, it really came into play when, when um, one of his former um, uh, students that he's worked with opened her own business. So Jared, maybe you can just touch on that a little bit and, and how that impacted the business. Yeah, I, I would just add from the view of the business community, you know, intellectual property rights are not at all about restricting access to things. It's really about incentivizing innovation and creativity to the betterment of society at large. Um, you mentioned, you know, medicines and generics. Well, the whole existence of generic medicines is predicated upon the prior existence of an innovative medicine that somebody created and, you know, invested billions of dollars and an average of 10 years of time to make. And without that, you never get a generic. So that's just one example of how intellectual property is actually about providing access um, to society and improving people's lives. Um, the, uh, the example Andrew mentioned was, um, and this is a good example, I think, about how, you know, I'm a U.S. Chamber representative, but IP isn't just important to big businesses. Um, there is a woman who I went to college with, I didn't know her when I was at college, at university, um, but I met her in the course of my work at the Chamber. Her name's Liz Fields. Um, she, upon graduation, followed her dream of, um, of opening a design shop. She um, designed wedding dresses. Her company took off. Um, she hired five or six employees. She did several million dollars, I think three million dollars a year in revenue. So small business, but um, growing. And as soon as people started to recognize her product and like it, um, there were immediately thousands of counterfeits flooded the market. She spent so much of her day, she would tell me, just scouring um, the internet through Google to find these counterfeit Liz Fields wedding dress sites, um, mostly coming from China. Um, and it became a huge problem for her, not only in terms of time, but in terms of lost revenue. She had, um, you know, people were buying the fake product instead of the real product. And then to twist the knife even more, that in turn forced her to compete on price with the counterfeit of her own product. Um, so it deprived her of a huge amount of revenue. Um, and over time, <clears throat> it got so bad where it, it caused her to shutter her business. Um, and now she's doing something else. Um, and it was, the, the sole reason for it was counterfeiting. Um, we did a study recently um, to try to quantify the scale of global counterfeiting, and it's off the charts. And I, we, the last one we did, I think, was five years ago, and it's up 20% or something since then. But now it's, I think, about $750 billion a year of merchandise is counterfeited worldwide. Um, <clears throat> and it's not just, you know, Andrew mentioned counterfeit medicines. It's literally 
any product, if people want it and like it, it's counterfeited. I've seen everything from counterfeit airbags and cars, counterfeit brake pads, obviously counterfeit clothing, counterfeit contact lenses, I mean, you name it. Um, so the problem of IP theft is a huge issue for businesses small and large across the board. Um, but again, I just want to reiterate that from the Chamber's perspective and our members, and I think we've tried to convey that in, in this study that we've passed out, um, intellectual property um, is, a, is about helping society, not restricting access to things. Thank you, Jared. And any questions from the audience for any, any of the panelists here? Comments, thoughts? Yes, Kent? Paper, we see reports on CNN. It's about the Mickey Mouse patent that goes on for 150 years. Right? It's not about the wedding, the woman who loses her business. And I wonder if you have a view on the susceptibility, if it's more or less, or about the same as other industries that deal with economic regulation. The susceptibility to capture. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, there is obviously a, um, a battle of ideas here, and I think um, intellectual property, yes, I think it's, it's easy for opponents of IP to point to examples like Mickey Mouse or the, you know, the old lady who gets sued um, for downloading one song or something like that. Um, so I think there is a, a perception issue that is very difficult um, for IP intensive companies, absolutely. And I think Andrew and I, in, in speaking to groups all over the place, have seen that many, many times. Um, so the answer is, if this answers your question, yes, I do think there is a major challenge there. Um, and I think it's incumbent upon us, as uh, a representative of industry, to get those stories out there in a way that's better heard and more effective, the stories like the Liz Fields, or. Um, you know, the person who was saved by the latest um, breakthrough medicine, things like that. Um, but yeah, I do think there's a, a serious challenge there. Yeah, do you have anything, Andrew, you want to add? No. Hi, I'm Henry Schneider. I would like to ask a question, maybe to you, sir, about the battle of ideas. It seems to me that there are more than one problems here, or more than one cases. The one case is the, the patent itself. For example, you have a drug, and it's important to keep that uh, drug patented that saves lives. I think most people, even the most libertarians, can relate to that. Okay, it's R&D intensive. Okay. But then there is a, the whole question of royalties. That is more difficult to grasp, especially from the very libertarian point of view, but I, I also think with intuition. As the example was, the singer sang the song, had a deal with the, with the record label, and, and, and the buyer bought the CD, and that's it. Why should a hotel or a restaurant pay royalty for playing that CD which has been bought about? Because they're not making money with it, they're just making noise. So there are two different, there are, I, at least from my point of view, there are two different strings. Uh, and also they appeal to two different intuitions. I think most people would say, okay, patent, there is some intuition, yeah, it was a good idea, we should honor that, but royalties is just cashing in in a regulatory cartel. A 
Okay. Thank you for, for your question. Uh, I fully agree. So I can, I can really uh, agree regarding the patents. I have an issue with royalties, especially uh, in the example that I mentioned, uh, because it was a situation with hotels, restaurants, bars, and etc. And one of the key issues in the specific case was uh, it wasn't a fixed royalty. It was connected with the number of seats at the premises. So what it means? It means that you're extracting more money, which I honestly think you, you as, as a musician or you as an NGO do not deserve. So I fully agree that uh, we must make a dis distinction between royalties, especially royalties of this kind, and uh, protection of patents, like colleagues mentioned, that are really important for development of drugs or any kind of other technolog technological improvement. So just some quick thoughts on royalties. I, I think that it, the copyright industry can be um, difficult to defend. When we work with the movie industry, they always want to tout how much money that they made for each film that they put out. They made millions and millions of dollars, but they don't talk about the films that didn't make any money. Eight out of 10 films never see the light of day and, or in, in, as far as revenue goes. And, and copyright is, is really difficult for, for me to understand as well because there's so many different players. When you hear a song, like in the lobby of a hotel, you think, okay, there's a song, they should be able to play it. But there's the songwriter, there's the singer, there's the label, there's the producer and their arrangements are actually really screwed up on who makes the most money. Songwriters are restricted on how much they can make per each song based on a district court in New York's decision. Um, we at the Chamber of Commerce represents the recording industry of America. Those are the labels. Those guys have a unique position and I think um, have been, done very well under the existing situation. Um, so it, there, there's a lot of different dynamics when we talk about copyright and who should be reimbursed and who should be paid but um, sure. yeah I, I would just add I mean I guess you know so I don't know how many of you guys have had the opportunity to talk to songwriters and musicians it's part of my job to actually go work with these guys and I guess I would just offer for thought I, I understand um, the debate around royalties and the perception issues there but what I've come to learn through my work here is that royalties are the linchpin that make the music business a viable industry. Um, the vast majority of musicians fail, and the vast majority of musicians who do succeed are not, you know, the Mick Jaggers of the world who have a constant stream of royalties for 50 years. Most musicians, if they make it at all, which they're unlikely to, are popular for four or five years, and then everybody moves on. Um, so it's royalties, that make um, a, a, a viable living a realistic prospect in the music business. Um, like one example, and this is one of the, the more successful ones that I've been able to talk to. I, I don't know if anyone here remembers the band Collective Soul. They were really big in the early 90s. We've done some work uh, with the lead singer, Ed Rolland. And I mean, if I said, hey, I met Ed Rolland, no one would know what I was talking about. You know, the lead singer of Collective Soul, everyone's forgotten about him. Um, although he's still out there making music and playing and all that, but it, he's totally dependent on royalties from that four-year patch when Collective Soul was the biggest band in, in America, and that's allowed him to continue pursuing his passion, music, and supporting now his wife and two kids. Um, and if you take royalties away, I mean, not only are you doing a disservice to musicians, you're doing a disservice to culture and those of us who like music. Um, and the other thing uh, to note is just, I mean, art, um, like other things, art has value. And so things that have value cannot just be taken. Um, someone there um, deserves the fruits of their labor. Um, so that's kind of uh, my take on, on the royalty question, understanding there are very different points of view. Yeah, well, on the on the royalty question, my uh, my cousin Hayek's daughter owns the rights uh, to all 
Hayek books in all languages except English. So she always has uh, a credit card from a special account and whenever she invites us to dinner, she says, you know, tonight the professor is paying. Now, taken into, into account that uh, he's been dead for 25 years, that brings the whole discussion of how long these things should go on, point one of the question. Point two, there is the most used picture of Hayek ever on the internet, and nobody knows who took it. And everybody uses it on every dust jacket, on every book, whatever. And there's a company that found it in some archive and scanned it and is now charging royalties for the use of a picture that nobody knows who took it, nobody knows where they found it, uh, or who the, who the originator of it is. So that's, in my opinion, a real racket. And, I mean, as a family, we could sue them, but, you know, they're a very major company and we have problems. So my question is, what do you do with that? With that kind of thing, the appropriation of somebody's ideas. Yeah, I think that raises some real challenges. I mean, you talk about books or you talk about pictures. Um, the Internet, while it's great for many reasons, also poses some dangers to intellectual property protection. Um, the United States tried to create legislation around this, and other countries have done similar things, specifically Australia. The Stop Online Piracy Act, SOPA, and some of you may recall it, it was the largest backlash of grassroots that the, the country's ever seen. So there are certain things that you can do around to protect intellectual property online, uh, different types of legislative and regulatory initiatives, but it continues to be a challenge. When you put something online, it's really almost for the public domain then, um, and people have access to it. So certainly there are challenges um, that technology brings, and I think you continue to work with governments to create your own personalized solutions for that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Quick one. I don't have a problem with the royalties thing. We have a similar organization for music in the UK, Performing Rights Society. Um, I firstly, on, you've, everyone says you've bought the CD, why can't I do what I like with it? Well, you've bought the physical thing with a restricted set of rights as to what, how you can use that. Just like, you know, you can buy um, a building or an apartment with a, set, with a restricted set of rights that says you can't run a business from here or whatever. You know, we've, we accept that in other um, property situations, so why not with music? And secondly, you know, someone said the restaurant owner, they're not making money out of playing the music. Well, of course they are, because otherwise they wouldn't spend money on the sound system and buying the CD. They think they make more money because, they, um, because they're playing the music. That's why they're doing it, to attract customers in or whatever. So, yeah, I, d I don't have a problem, and I don't know why um, libertarians get so hung up about it. I agree there's perhaps a problem that some of these licensing organizations end up with effectively monopoly status. So perhaps we need to open up a bit more competition there. But the basic principle of intellectual property and licensing that out and having different sets of rights depending on what you want to do with it, where's, where's the problem? Yeah, some interesting points there. Um, you know, I, I may tend to agree with you about royalties, and I don't know that it is anyone's opinion to tell someone how much they can or can't make off a certain property that they own. But I think that you bring up an interesting point with the licensing. And I think about my Microsoft Office that I use on my computer. I thought that I bought that for this surface. When I left the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, I said, I want to take it with me. And I called Microsoft, and they said, no, you bought the license for it, and you're not, it isn't applicable. So I had to rebuy the whole licensing again. I thought I bought the program. Um, I think that that exists with music, uh, but it's particularly interesting, I think, with, with soft uh, software. Thank you. J briefly, uh, well, I do have a problem. Uh, one of the things we both agree is the lack of competition if we accept that these royalties should exist in this form, in this form in particular. Uh, usually, I have an experience in the same business, so I'm not sure that people are coming to the restaurant to listen to music. They're coming A, to have a good food, B, to have a good wine, and C, to have a good company. And D, music is something that goes on. But there, then... Okay. Well, actually, I own one, so I'm not an outsider. That's the reason, that's the reason I told you. And, and uh, there is a solution. Okay, I do, I do, and, and I, 
and I paid it because I don't like the, so the sound of silence. And there is a solution. That's a good song. That's a good song, huh? <laughs> the, there is a solution. We should hire a professional musician and pay to him. Is there any royalties in that case? No. Is he reproducing the music of certain other musicians? Yes. Here, no. no if, you, if you hire me or you as musicians for the night, nothing is applicable regarding royalties. James the, founder of, James, the founder of the Capitalist Ball. I wonder whether you have a trademark protected. It's now known as the Liberty Ball. Thanks a lot. And yes, I'm also a trademark holder in the US and soon in the EU as of last year. Thank you very much. And Congratulations. Sorry, and uh, at the Liberty Ball, uh, yeah, to your question, we do have live musicians uh, performing songs by the likes of Frank Sinatra, who were not written by Frank Sinatra. But nonetheless, the organization in Belgium is called Sabam and we paid them normally around 600 euros for one night, um, which may seem like a lot, uh, but to hear other people play Sinatra, and, and I agree, those royalties may not be paid to the estate of Frank Sinatra or to Capitol Records. It may go to just a general database of people, but that's not really my affair. To me, uh, what's important as the entertainment provider is I'm paying about a euro 20 per person to hear this great music. And uh, to the question about the restaurant, I think it's the same. That Euro 20 is the value of hearing good music uh, when you're at my party. Um, we could instead play something by my cousin. I could probably get a better, better rate um, or, or by my, you know, by, by a friend, but uh, it probably wouldn't offer the same experience to the people coming. So uh, that's, that's uh, what I wanted to say. I think the rest was covered by the others. Thank you. Uh, it was Chris, and then Gordon. Okay. Uh, the, the presentations up till now primarily have been rather sugarcoating this whole issue. It seems to me that you, for the purpose of the audience uh, participation and understanding, you should talk a bit more about the uh, the costs of patents. I mean, we've we we've been told that they exist only for the good of society. Uh, and so that, that gives us sort of a, uh, a more positive impression because, as it turns out, patents are a government-imposed monopoly that generates rent-seeking behavior, which is non-productive and leads to inefficiencies, including patent wars, patent trolling. Uh, the, the thinking back to James Watt, he, he spent much of his career trying to keep people from improving the steam engine, which actually worked against society. He spent much of his uh, wealth to do that. And it was all about protecting. So what we find now is that Apple and Samsung, instead of putting money, hundreds of millions of dollars that go into uh, legal fees and court settlements, instead it's diverted from research and development, which is not productive for the community. So you've given sort of a one-sided issue, I mean one-sided uh, argument here, and I, I suppose the rest of the audience uh, would like to hear more about some of these uh, less um, salubrious aspects of uh, patents. Now, and also re with re remarks on uh, the sort of general libertarian approach to the idea of intellectual property, people tend to view copyrights with a much more uh, open-minded uh, acceptance, whereas patents tend to be there's a, a bit more pushback on that. Uh, thank you. I, I think you bring up a good point. Um, so the alternative to having patents is not having patents. So we could follow that, <laughs> right? We could follow that logic, and you would never have the drug disclosed. You would never have the chemical makeup of the drug disclosed. It, exist in the first place. it, it may not even exist in the first place. But that drug then would never be given to society. It would try the company's goal would be not to disclose that. So, with his polio vaccine, it worked. He worked with a university to help craft it. So it's that's complicated. With and you have funding of the university. Yeah, for for his own choice. Yeah. So when when you look to businesses, they want to be able to make money. So you said that patents are a government-imposed monopoly. 
I, I don't necessarily think that way. I think that it's a trade-off. Companies, individuals, entrepreneurs register their patent with the patent office for protection for that patent, which then is eventually given to society. So I view it more of as trade-off. And I think that countries should be free to choose what system works for them. Um, you said people are more hostile to patents than copyright. I don't necessarily think that's true. I think if you look in the global IP. Libertarian. Oh, libertarians, okay. Well, I think that you, you look at copyright in some places like Denmark, and they don't necessarily care for it at all. So it, it, those, the respect for certain the variations of intellectual property, I think vary country by country, but uh, I, I think that you bring up some good points. Yeah, just to, I guess, dovetail on that, I mean, I, I agree. Um, um, and, you know, I'm here representing the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, so um, yes, this is a one-sided point of view coming from me. We are unapologetically pro-IP. Um, so, yes, correct. Um, but to Andrew's point, um, you know, yeah, you can, you can, as with anything, you can come up with, you know, extreme cases of abuse of regulations and laws and point to those. But I'll tell you, on a broader scale, like with patents, for example, take away patents and see how long the Pfizer's of the world, the Bears, whoever, continue to invest tens of billions of dollars in 10 years of time to create the next innovative medicine, because it's not going to be long. Agree. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm supporting Chris here. I, I'm sorry, Jared. I'm just not buying this at all. I, you know, Adam Smith said as soon as groups of businessmen in the same industry, industry get together, we should all be very wary. And you know, the example you've chosen, and I've got to be brief, obviously, is the music industry. Well, you know. Rest in peace, George Michael. He, you know, we were all denied the benefits of his production for 20 odd years because of Sony's imposition of supposedly egregious terms. Yet he was a free willed man of aged 18 who signed a contract. So we as libertarians would say, well, then he should be bound by his own legal decisions. But, in, you know, I'm not an expert in music at all, but every single major incident I can remember, for example, the Spotify emergency in the late 90s and the Bertelsmann, every single time the music industry cartelizes goes very much over the top, very heavy handed, and frankly has to back off, gets a bit embarrassed. And then recently with that young girl from, uh, I can't remember the one, uh, uh, the, the blonde girl from uh, America refusing to sell her stuff on uh, Spotify, you know, Taylor Swift, you know, there, there's uh, Adele, there's, there, this is happening all the time. There's, a lot of musicians feel they're being very, very badly treated by this, this kind of thing. And, and, and I, I, ju I just feel that the conclusions you're making about if these patterns d did not exist, then, you know, these drugs wouldn't, wouldn't be made and therefore people will die. Of but it sounds to me very much like the arguments that were used to justify bailing out the banks in 2007. And here we are 10 years on, zero interest rates, the financial equivalent of us all living in concentration camps under Nazi Germany with no one ever bought a house anywhere. You know, you're going an awfully long way to reach your conclusion. Well, <laughs> I disagree. <laughs> um, um, Again, I mean, we're gonna, I guess we might have to agree to disagree on this one. I mean, the word patent itself comes from the Greek, which means to, to open up, to lay bare. So um, the, the whole underpinnings of the IP system are about improving lives, improving society. Um, that's what we believe that it does, um, whether it be patents or copyrights. And I'll tell you, I mean, the musicians that I talk to, they care about IP. They care about their copyrights. The actual practitioners do. And sure, I mean, there are instances, I mean, where the music industry has um, overreacted and shot themselves in the foot and, and lost the PR battle big time. Um, and, you know, I don't think we're here to defend those instances or the examples you raised. I mean, they sound as ridiculous to me as they do to you. Um, but I think you, you have to... <laughs> I don't disagree with you there. And I think it's incumbent upon them, and it's frustrating to, to those of us who work with them sometimes, um, how stubborn they can be. But I think, um, you know, the music industry, for example, or um, the film industry, it's incumbent upon them to adapt with technology and, in, and respond to the desires of consumers. I mean, look at a, a business like Blockbuster. 
I mean, no one goes, I, I don't know if we had Blockbuster here, but in the U.S., there, Blockbuster is, you know, a thing of the past because they just failed to respond to the Internet and, um, the, you know, the wishes of consumers. And so, that, I mean, that's just one example, but um, I, I agree. I mean, I think uh, the music um, and film industry in particular need to adapt to um, the wishes of consumers and the way that they obtain content. Um, I guess that's a little bit of diversion from your question, but as an aside. Jared, uh, I come with a pretty open mind. I don't have a strong view either way. So I was a little bit confused by your collective soul analogy. So I want to see if I've understood this correctly. Uh, this gentleman wrote successful music for four years from 93 to 97 and I should feel good about the fact that that's funded him for the next 20 years to go on producing commercially unsuccessful content, uh, which no one really wants to listen to. You actually convinced me the other way uh, at the end of that. So I want you to have another go. Sure. Well, that's an interesting way of framing it. Um, but um, I think, I guess the point I'm trying to say is that the odds of success in the music industry for any one musician and more than that, for any one song, are incredibly low. A place like Nashville, for example, there are 600 new songs um, submitted per week um, in Nashville. The vast majority of them fail. I mean, it's, it, making it in the music business is very, very, very difficult. And the system that's in place with royalties creates the possibility of success and makes it a viable career path to pursue. And the vast majority of musicians do not get rich. Um, and you know, Ed Brolin from Collective Soul did moderately well. He lives a, a middle class existence with his family, but the success of a few of his songs has made that a viable career path, has allowed him to continue pursuing it as an artist. Um, and I think society at large benefits. Um, and you say no one's listening to his songs, that may be true. But I'm still the, the, yeah, well, exactly, but those songs from 95 would not have existed without a viable career path that is enabled through intellectual property. Well, and also look at Men at Work and the song Down Under. I mean, they had to pay royalties because the opening riff of that song sounded very similar to something that was produced decades before that. But getting back to royalties and the importance, I'm look at the Jimi Hendrix estate, that they have refused to release their music for any biopics. And people on the other side say, well, isn't this promoting his music? And wouldn't a biopic with his music help promote him and his music? But what if it's done in a negative light? What if this biopic is done that makes him look like a drug addict? I know. <laughs> but, but you see where the problem is, that people has, should have control over this intellectual property so it's not used in, uh, in negative ways. But can, here's the question is, and this is different than music, but it goes back to drugs is, uh, well, I guess we're still on drugs with Hendrix, is uh, the, the UN and the compulsory licensing that some of these international bodies like the EU and the UN are trying to uh, force on drug companies and how that's really going to um, slow down R&D and probably take a lot of money a, a, away from R&D. So can either of you address the UN and what they've done in the past year or so to really weaken intellectual property? Um, sure. So over the past uh, year and a half or so, and I should say I'm not an expert on this particular topic, but um, the UN commissioned um, a high-level panel on access to medicines um, that was sort of a sham uh, from the get-go. Um, it was the, the panel itself was created and um, with the uh, underpinning at the outset, they released sort of a statement of principles and essentially said that um, intellectual property rights and human rights were incompatible. Um, so that sort of told us immediately the direction which this panel was going to go. Um, and surprise, surprise, a year later they sort of reached that conclusion. Um, but what it really is, um, is an effort um, on the left in, in collusion with um, several developing countries around the world um, to make that sort of philosophical argument um, to invalidate IP um, to advance their cause of, of basically um, compulsory licensing um, innovative medicines. Um, so that's sort of what the high-level panel does. 
Um, and that just wrapped up uh, last November or something like that. I don't know if any of you have worked on this. But um, we continue to see from some of these um, multilateral organizations in the left um, a very coordinated effort to undermine IP on a philosophical level. Uh, I have a, a question. Um, is there an opportunity or a chance for us libertarians if we look at new technology like blockchain technology, uh, which is used for protection of physical property right now, to register physical property, that we can use it for intellectual property to our advance, and by that, by using this modern technology, selling the argument in a better way why protection of IP is important. Is there, would this be logic or not, or what are your thoughts on that? It would be, would it be a step forward and advancement or not? Uh, a step forward. Uh, ways that we can use technology in order to protect uh, intellectual property and uh, relating it to physical property, I think would be a big improvement. Um, and I think that markets continue to be able to respond um, to those types of needs. So I think it would be uh, welcomed. Is, are there members of the, of, the, of the chamber, of the U.S. chamber, that are thinking in, in these dimensions or working already in these dimensions? Or is it just crazy libertarians who uh, think of uh, seasteading and, and uh, charter cities and others who use those technologies? Um, I think we're starting to have those conversations. Um, you know, the chamber um, has not historically been a, a cutting-edge, high-tech sort of outfit. We're trying to change that. Um, we recently um, launched a new uh, division of the chamber called um, CTEC, the Chamber Technology Engagement Center, um, where those sorts of conversations are beginning. Um, so that center was just launched uh, last year. Um, so yes, it's something that we're working on. So maybe, and I'm advertising for our think tanks here, so maybe uh, you could uh, link us or... We would welcome all the help we can get. Well, hearing no others, thank you very much. Thank you for allowing us the opportunity uh, to share with you.